hi everyone. Um, I'm Dylan Cronin. Um, I am currently at OSU. Uh, I'm in Matt Sullivan and Virginia Rich's uh, labs. Um, and a lot of the work I do, I'm, I'm basically a bioinformatician. Um, so uh, this is sort of the bread and butter of, of the work that I do. Um, so today, um, I'm going to be mostly talking about just sort of general um, metagenomics workflow almost, um, and then specifically getting into mags uh, towards the end and like some refinement um, and how you can get genomes from your, uh, your sequencing data. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, this is the Microbiome Informatics webinar series um, on Tuesdays. Uh, so you've heard so far from uh, Matt Sullivan, uh, Sharif, and Olivier um, covering, you know, more abstract ideas in this field to uh, 16S sequencing, um, uh, using a server um, and uh, long read uh, sequencing for viruses in particular, but it could be applied elsewhere as well. Um, so most of what I'll talk about today is um, in relation to short reads. Uh, so basically the general workflow is um, we start with our environmental DNA on the top left here, um, you know, and it's intact. And then after sequencing on short reads, um, it becomes fragmented. Um, and so what you ultimately want to do is to take all those short reads, assemble them together um, into like pieces. So you can see the same colors are sort of grouping together here to build contigs. Um, and so you are trying to assemble the best reference that you can from your original environmental DNA, but you typically can't recover the whole genome um, for a wide variety of reasons. Um, but that is ultimately what the binning step is for. So we take our contigs, uh, we try to group contigs that are very similar to one another. Um, and then ultimately those groupings are what's considered um, a, a genome bin. Um, and, and so there's sort of this um, nomenclature around uh, genome bins and mags. Uh, ultimately, they're the same thing. Um, however, genome bins are typically uh, more draft versions um, of what a mag is. So a mag is a metagenome assembled genome. Um, and that is considered a more final state um, where a bin is more draft, uh, just to clarify that up front. And so basically from each of these points um, along this workflow, um, you can do different analyses. Um, so from your short reads, uh, you can just straight map to a reference database and get some kind of idea of what's in your sample. Um, and there are plenty of programs um, that can enable you to do that uh, relatively quickly. Um, however, you know that's limited to uh, what's in the reference database. So if you have um, if you have sequences that don't exist there, then um, you're limited in that way. Um, and then contigs uh, from contigs, uh, you can predict genes and then have a sort of genes to ecosystems approach. So what that means is um, taking all of your genes um, and then just assuming that they all function together. Um, so you sort of have a soup of genes and they do some function on the environment and then you can understand how they're interacting with the environment in that way. So it's a little naive in that it's not associated with a genome. Um, because it's not really the case that you can just pass every single product um, from microbe to microbe, for example. Um, and then also typically from contigs, um, we also do viral ecology. Um, and I think there will, there will be a, um, a webinar later on uh, specifically for that. 
Um, and then ultimately, um, the, this last level here is a genomes to ecosystems approach. So we have our genomes. Um, we know uh, generally uh, who they are. Um, and so we know who they are and we know what they're doing. Um, and so that's sort of the advantage of the genomes to ecosystems approach. Um, in general, uh, this is the processing pipeline that I will go over. And uh, just to uh, put it out there as well, um, I'll also be providing a GitHub link. Um, and that GitHub link will mostly just have the commands and installation and everything that you need um, to, to uh, process a sample. Um, and so it'll have like example cases, but it won't run every single um, sample uh, from the data set that I'm talking about today. Um, so uh, we start with uh, our reads and we need to do some kind of quality control um, just so that any errors that are in the reads don't propagate outwards um, towards further data products. Um, and then we assemble those reads, like I said before, using various programs. Um, and then we can build bins uh, from, from the assemblies. So uh, the, the data that I leveraged um, for this webinar in particular is the Kami data set. So it's the critical assessment of metagenomic uh, metagenome interpretation. Um, so basically what it is is simulated um, data um, from 596 genomes um, and it's meant to be high complexity. So they added some strain level diversity in there. Um, in reality, it's not all that high complexity um, compared to like a real true environmental sample such as uh, from soil. Um, but uh, it's, it's a good data set for benchmarking purposes. Um, and then the data set I chose is the high complexity, which means also that they had a time series component to it. So basically there are five samples um, that are associated to this high complexity data set. And so um, what I'm gonna focus on first is the quality control and it's uh, fairly straightforward. Um, so generally uh, the, the sequences that you get back, they're going to have some error, um, ambiguous bases um, or incorrect calls. Um, and then in addition to that, um, the sequences will also have adapters and primers that you need to remove or else um, the assembly could try to use those um, to uh, assemble your sequences together and you really don't want that um, because that would be incorrect. Um, and then if you do a harder quality control, it can ease the computational burden on your assembly, uh, which can be an issue. Um, typically, I would say that you won't be quality controlling that hard um, to where it's actually going to ease it that much, but it is, it is possible um, doing certain normalization techniques. Um, and then uh, ultimately, uh, you can visualize the quality of your reads uh, through FastQC and MultiQC. Um, so FastQC uh, generates this, well, they both generate a report based on your sample, um, but multi-QC can handle uh, multiple samples at once. Um, and so this is just uh, one example of a FastQC report. Um, so on the left here, you have a summary um, of uh, various statistics and um, distributions that it expects. Uh, so FastQC wasn't necessarily built for metagenome data. Um, so some of its assumed distributions aren't always perfect. Um, so you may get uh, these red X's thrown at you that um, something isn't right, uh, but it's just worth looking into um, in case there is actually something wrong there. Uh, and then, uh, so this is a per base quality uh, graph um, of what your reads could potentially look like. Um, this is 
probably a, a worst case scenario or it's the the distribution on this is not great um, and uh, so basically on the x-axis here, you have the position on your read. Um, on the y-axis is the quality. Um, so this is a, a quality score uh, from the sequencing. Um, and I have that here. So basically a FRED uh, quality score of 10 means you have 90% um, accuracy. Um, and then up to 20, it's um, at 99%. Um, so Generally, you want to stay in this yellow to green area, um, ideally. And yeah, so ideally, you would stay in green, um, so uh, lowest error rate possible. Um, and, and generally, uh, going from the five prime uh, to three prime end, um, the quality degrades. Um, and that's true uh, for, most, um, for most sequencing. Um, so especially when you get into longer reads, the, uh, the sequencing tends to get worse um, the longer the read is. And uh, so you also wanna remove adapters. Um, so there are pretty standard adapters um, that uh, come from the sequencing platform um, and they may or may not be removed uh, by the sequencing center that you sent your sample to. Um, and so this is just another good way to check if those are in your sample. Um, in this case, they are not, uh, so that's good. Um, so typically uh, there are two, um, I would say most popular tools uh, for read quality control, but these are by no means the only ones. Um, <laughs> there are a ton of these um, and Honestly, a lot of them um, probably work just fine. Um, and so it's really just a matter of preference. Um, so Trimomatic and BBDuck are um, pretty easy to use. However, BBDuck is uh, actually faster than Trimomatic. Um, so uh, that is what I used in, in this example. But again, um, you can really use um, any sort of quality control tool. Um, and then I, I provided um, the commands for a Conda installation. Um, just something for you to note, um, generally a best practice for um, installing Conda environments is to include the version. Um, and then ultimately, if you need to update uh, from a previous version, you want to create a whole new environment um, because there could be potential conflicts and things. Um, so uh, whenever I include installation on the slides, this is generally what uh, the commands that are there. Um, and then uh, through BBDuck, um, you can do quality control and trimming all in the same command. Um, so basically what I'm providing it here, um, this rh underscore s001 is the uh, fast Q read um, from one of the samples. And, and so this file is interleaved. And that means that both the forward and reverse reads are contained within that file. And so the nice thing about these BB tools typically is that they can take in one format and output another. Um, so for most programs, um, you're going to want paired, uh, uh, paired reads. Um, and so, uh, you can just generate that straight up through this command. Um, so out one is the forward reads, um, out two is the uh, reverse reads. Um, I'm setting a minimum length of uh, 51. So it's um, generally a good idea to set uh, a minimum length of at least um, a third of what your sequencing length would be. Um, this is still uh, extremely short and typically um, you won't even find reads that short, so it should be okay anyway. Um, quality trimming, so from uh, both sides of the sequence and then providing um, a minimum average quality of, of the read um, and then uh, basically the, the windows that uh, it should average that quality to be. And then max ends means no ends in, in the reads. 
And and so also uh, this is important. Um, this ref uh, is also pointing to adapters. So the nice thing about um, about uh, BB tools is that they provide this adapters file, which includes all of the standard adapters um, that sequencing uh, tends to add on. Um, other programs don't always do that, um, and so it's a it's a nice addition here. And so when you run that command, um, this is a simplified version of it, but um, basically you uh, get a report of um, what it removed at each step um, and uh, what the resulting um, uh, number or percentage of reads is that you have left and bases. Um, so you can see that it trimmed more bases than reads. So that means some of the quality on the ends was uh, not optimal. Um, so it ended up trimming those down. But we're retaining most of our reads. Um, typically, I would say, uh, since this is simulated, it's probably higher quality than usual. Um, but uh, you should um, still be retaining a a large majority of your reads. So I would say at least 90% typically. And then running uh, FastQC on, on one of those files uh, that we cleaned, um, you get this report. So um, the quality is all high, um, which, which is good. And yeah, so, Ideally, you want to check for adapter content, overrepresented sequences, um, GC content, sequence duplication, and then just overall quality. And so now that we have some uh, uh, QC reads, uh, we can now go on to assembly. Um, and so generally, there are three. Uh, three more popular tools uh, right now for doing uh, assembly on uh, metagenomic data sets. Um, and that's uh, Metaspades, Megahit, and IDBA uh, UD. And so again, what we're doing is trying to take these short sequences um, and assemble them together. Uh, so Assemblers distinguish noise um, from biological variation. Um, so what that means is uh, sequences are not random. Um, so they have structure to them. Um, genes, operons, and promoters all exist within your sequences. Um, uh, there's biased uh, nucleotide usage um, in Kamer frequencies. Um, so for uh, proteins, for example, um, for certain lineages, you have more biased nucleotide uh, usage than others. Um, and, and for longer and longer sequences, um, there's a low probability that you'd randomly have that sequence. Um, and in addition to that, there are also repeated sequences. Um, so low complexity regions, um, conserved protein domains and duplicated genes. And so um, in general, there are two major algorithms. Um, one is overlap layout consensus, which I know Olivier mentioned um, last time, um, and then De Bruyne graphs. Um, and, and so there are two algorithms because uh, uh, initially actually um, we had longer reads um, and then in next gen sequencing, we went to more accurate short reads. And now we're sort of looping back again to longer reads. Um, so overlap layout consensus now is um, making a comeback. Um, but De Bruyne graphs are used for short reads typically and overlap layout consensus is typically used for long reads. And uh, just to go over um, what the De Bruyne graph is um, in general. Um, so up here, uh, we have our sequencing reads. Um, and so you have a forward, uh, so you have two, a forward and reverse read. Um, and then you want to take a camer of that read. 
So what a kamer is, is just um, a sequence of um, k length. So if it's a threemer, then it has um, three nucleotides. Uh, so in this case, you have three nucleotides, and then it's taking every possible kamer set it can from the read. Um, and then from that, you can then create a, a, um, a De Bruyne graph. And so what that means is that you're taking your kamer sets um, and then, or k minus one mer sets, and then uh, uh, basically um, you're able to draw a line between two that matched. So in this case, we had ATC up here. Um, so we have AT on the left here, and then we had TC. Um, so this ATC sequence um, is, is matched here on the graph. And then we had TCA. So TC um, is leveraging TCA um, and matching. Um, so this is built out for all of our reads. Um, and then we uh, can combine them for our reads um, and then uh, make some corrections based on the graph. Um, and this is a potentially um, error prone uh, process as well. So if the graph gets too large, um, it's hard to resolve what, what the end output should be. Um, uh, but if it's too small, um, then you're not actually able to build out a proper assembly. So uh, then there's overlap layout consensus. So um, essentially you take your reads um, you identify the overlaps. Um, and then based on the overlaps, you can draw connections to various reads. And then again, it's a, um, it's a graph uh, problem where you're trying to find a path um, along these reads. And so that ultimately ends up being um, what your end sequence is. And yes, yeah, so Again, um, we have a genome, uh, short reads. Uh, we take kamers from these. From the kamers, um, we can build out a graph. And then from that graph, we can assemble a contig. And uh, so in, in uh, De Bruyne graph, there are uh, two uh, pretty common problems. Um, and a lot of them come from uh, either error or uh, strain heterogeneity. Um, so if you have more than one strain in a sample, um, your camera frequencies uh, can uh, be altered so that, uh, for example, you have one uh, base change and that one base change can alter your graph. Um, but typically to resolve this sort of issue, which is called a bubble. So, um, you, I mean, you can tell why it's called a bubble. So uh, from here, there's a change in base, um, and you wouldn't be sh sure which way to go, but uh, these lines indicate that the uh, coverage is greatest um, along this path. So typically, what an assembler would do if there's a bubble here, um, it would go along this path, see that uh, there's a change in coverage, um, and it would follow the path that has the greatest amount of coverage. Um, if, if they had the, the same amount of coverage, uh, then it is possible that at this node, the graph would break. And so the assembly um, would just end right there. Um, and then the same thing happens at the end of sequences as well. Um, and so that's um, resolving tips. Uh, and um, another uh, important thing to know is, um, the selection of kamers is also extremely important. Um, so like I said before, um, if you use extremely short kamers, um, you're going to build a graph that has a lot of connections in between all of the nodes. Um, if you uh, build a graph, uh, or if you choose a kamer that is longer, um, you will have less connections um, but ultimately uh, the assembly likely uh, won't 
complete as far as it could. Um, so a lot of the uh, assemblers now, um, or at least the metagenomic sample uh, assemblers use uh, multiple Kamer sets um, to build out uh, an optimal graph. And um, just to illustrate that point a little further, um, so your Kamer choices can matter. Um, so this in particular is just one assembly. Um, and it's using an assembler that only uses one Kamer set at a time. Um, so on the left here is a 51 uh, mer for a Kamer set. Um, and you can see there are just a ton of connections um, and you're likely not going to get much meaning from this. Um, and then on the other hand, a 91 mer assembly um, has uh, not enough connections to actually build out the assembly proper, properly. Um, so typically um, a good uh, Kamer uh, length to choose is 80% of your read length. Um, the defaults for most of the assemblers that I've used work fairly well. Um, I think spades actually cuts off at a fairly short Kamer set. Um, so you could extend that one out further. Um, mega hit, on the other hand, um, uses uh, much more um, than spades for defaults. And so uh, this is considered, uh, the De Bruyne graphs were considered next-gen sequencing. Um, and uh, again, uh, the, the assemblers that are most prevalent now um, seem to be IDBAUD, spades, and mega hit. And so there are challenges um, when assembling genomes. Um, uh, so first of all, um, it, it can be a lot of data. Um, so if the assembler hasn't uh, accounted for that well enough, um, you may not be able to assemble that sample at all. Um, and uh, microbial genomes can have um, strain heterogeneity. So microbes can have strain heterogeneity, um, which means that you're going to have small variations, um, which could end up um, changing your graph. So you have a suboptimal assembly. And then in addition to that, uh, you can also have sequences that are highly conserved. And so because they're so highly uh, conserved, um, they're, they are they can be hard to assemble as well um, because there are just like small variations, but most of the sequence is the same. Um, and then in addition to that, repeat regions are issues. Um, and so a lot of what long read sequencing can do is uh, account for those problems. And so again, um, uh, a lot of the problems come from heterogeneity. Um, and similarity. So repeat, repeats, duplicated regions, um, and then how similar are genomes to one another. Um, so ultimately choosing an assembler um, uh, <laughs> can be complicated. Um, so ultimately you have to deal uh, within your memory requirements. Um, so for example, spades uses a lot of memory um, and uh, it's hard to overcome that even with samples that aren't extremely large as well. Um, and we have resources uh, for one of the largest supercomputers and some samples still can't assemble uh, with metaspades. Um, so there are alternatives, uh, Megahit is one of them. Um, it uses less resources. Um, generally, uh, its performance is a little worse, um, but it is way more resource efficient. And then um, actual samples uh, can uh, change the outcome as well. So if there's a lot of strain heterogeneity, some assemblers can handle that better than others. Um, and then ultimately, uh, there are some strategies for challenging samples, um, one of which is read normalization. Um, so you can do that um, through the BBNorm tool from BBTools. Um, 
an alternative to that is just straight up random subsampling um, of your sample. Um, so this can be done even if you can assemble your, uh, your read straight up. Um, but essentially, subsampling down um, can allow for less complexity, um, potentially, so you can actually assemble your sequences uh, longer. And uh, random subsampling can also be done through BB tools. Um, and then uh, a third, uh, I would say much less optimal option, um, but uh, for microbial metagenomics, um, specifically related to bacteria and archaea, um, there, uh, you could separate out, for example, uh, eukaryotic reads um, before you try the assembly if you have a lot of eukaryotic contamination um, in, your, in your sample. And so just quickly, um, this is what an example command of mega hit looks like. So I went through um, the installation again, um, same as before, essentially. Um, and then uh, so you have your forward read, your reverse read, and then just the output um, and the number of threads. And it's pretty simple. Um, and so this is ultimately what the output ends up looking like. Um, so with mega hit, you end up with a file um, that's called final.contigs.fa, uh, which is a FASTA file of all your contigs. Um, and it does contain some information about the sequence. Um, generally, you don't use that too much, um, but it does indicate length and such as well. OK, so now that we have contigs, um, how do we obtain abundances? Uh, so that is done through read mapping. Um, so you take that original, uh, so that cleaned set of reads that you have. Um, and instead of uh, this being reference genome, you can think of it as a contig. Um, it could be a reference genome as well. Um, and then essentially, you're just trying to align your reads uh, to this reference genome. And so uh, when you do that, uh, you can sort of gain uh, two estimates from that. Um, one is percent cover. So that's horizontal coverage. Um, so how much of the contig are you covering? And then there's uh, another stat that's um, uh, vertical coverage or depth. Um, so uh, how many reads are uh, lining up in the same position? And so from those stats, um, you can uh, calculate your coverage for a contig um, and use that uh, in uh, calculating abundances. And so typically, horizontal coverage is used to um, reduce uh, the uh, reduce the possibility that you're incorrectly calling a a sequence to be in a sample. Um, so you want to set some X percent of the contig covered uh, to call it present. Um, and then the vertical coverage is what's actually used for the abundance estimation. And uh, so generally, uh, the tools used for that are uh, Bowtie 2, um, more recently Minimap 2, um, BWA, and several others. Um, and then there are some wrappers uh, that can make your read mapping life easier. Um, and that is CoverM um, and read to ref mapper uh, can also do some um, calculations for coverages. Um, generally, uh, CoverM can leverage both Minimap2 and BWA for read mapping. Um, and I think read to ref mapper could potentially take um, inputs from the others as well. Um, and then ultimately from your read mapping, you have BAM and SAM files. Um, and so these are the sequence alignment maps. Um, a, a BAM file is essentially just a compressed version of your SAM file. Um, and it gives you information about where the read is aligning to. Um, and you can calculate the coverages from those files. And then again, um, you can end up getting um, some estimates of coverages. So uh, from your contigs, um, you can actually do quite a lot. Um, so uh, what I mentioned before was the genes to ecosystems approach um, 
and you can also do viral ecology from contigs directly. Um, so you can take your contigs um, and predict uh, open reading frames. Um, so essentially you're predicting uh, the proteins um, and uh, there are lots of tools that can enable you to do this. Um, uh, Prodigal is one of the more popular um, now, but uh, yeah, there are several uh, that allow you to predict proteins from your sequences. And then basically uh, from your genomes, uh, you can predict genes, as I just said, uh, or proteins. And then from those, uh, you can create a BLASTDB. So from that BLASTDB, you can search all of your sequences against all of your sequences. So it's an all versus all search um, to create a, um, a matrix of um, your, your genes um, to each other and how uh, related they are um, in terms of uh, percent identity, for example. And then ultimately uh, from this sort of uh, structure, you can create a protein cluster um, or a gene cluster. So what is represented here, um, the lines in between each gene indicate the uh, percent identity. Um, so the thicker, the more related. Um, so when you have lots of genes that are highly related to one another, uh, they end up clustering together um, in the context of all genes. Um, so this gene cluster or protein cluster can be used as a, um, uh, as a framework uh, for uh, doing ecology on your samples. And uh, so uh, this is just one example of that um, in the OMRGC uh, V2, which is uh, a Tara Oceans expedition. Um, essentially, they uh, predicted genes and gene clusters uh, based on their sequences. Um, they could look at if they're finding any more in their samples um, and look at taxonomy of those um, of those uh, gene clusters and contigs as well. And then in addition to that, they can take uh, the abundances of their genes and then also relate them to uh, various environmental parameters um, and, and uh, determine what's uh, driving um, some functional composition of microbes in the ocean. And uh, something else that's worth noting is that marker genes are another mechanism uh, for gene-based ecology. Uh, so uh, one way to do that is through an HMM profile. Um, so essentially what an HMM profile is, um, rather quickly, um, you start with a multiple sequence alignment. Uh, you have, uh, you can then model um, insertions and deletions. Uh, and the probability that that insertion or deletion exists. Um, and then the HMM uh, can then take a new sequence and determine how likely it is that uh, it is a hit to the profile. And so like you can see on the top right here, um, you have your sequences that are aligned. Um, you have uh, the various changes um, along each position. And then uh, those can be modeled uh, with probabilities and this sort of graph structure. And so um, you can have a gene, for example, um, that is a marker gene for methanogenesis. Um, and so if you have a marker gene that um, is indicating um, uh, potential for uh, methane metabolism, um, then you may want to just search for that um, across all of your samples um, instead of uh, looking for genomes in particular. And so generally you, you create an HMM um, based on uh, some of the reference sequences that you already have. Um, and then you can search um, the rest of your sequences against that HMM. Um, 
and determine whether or not it aligns well. Um, and from there, uh, it's sort of identifying if you are having uh, the specific marker gene in your sample. Um, and in addition to that, uh, diversity metrics in general um, are more robust using single copy genes. Um, so uh, these are a type of marker gene. Um, single copy genes exist in the genome once. Um, so you can actually estimate abundances um, a little more accurately uh, using those single copy genes. Uh, and so uh, one package that enables you to do that is single M. Um, and uh, what is being shown here is just uh, Shannon diversity calculation based on a bunch of samples um, across different habitats. Um, and uh, it's a good way to calculate diversity in a metagenome. Um, so uh, ultimately, uh, how do we build mags um, or population genomes? Um, so again, we start out with our genomes. We have sequencing. Um, we uh, assemble those short reads into contigs, um, and then we can build uh, mags from that. And then uh, ultimately, um, population genomes uh, are, so mags generally are considered population genomes because um, they are not necessarily uh, a strain level uh, representation. Um, so oftentimes uh, a mag is a population genome because it can potentially contain many closely related strains um, all within the same, uh, what we consider a genome. And then in addition to that from, uh, from contigs, uh, you can also uh, determine viral populations, um, but I won't go into that. And so the two metrics um, that are really used for uh, building mags are sequence composition and differential coverage. Um, and so I'll go into detail about that. And so ultimately you're taking your similar contigs um, and you're trying to group them together. Um, and it doesn't always work out perfectly. Um, so you will have some contamination at times, um, but uh, generally it works fairly well and you can also control for that contamination in some ways. So how do we determine uh, differential coverage uh, from our uh, contigs? So first you uh, map your reads um, against uh, your set of contigs. So if you have three samples, you are taking this uh, reads from sample one and mapping it to your contigs the reads from sample two, mapping it against your set of contigs and sample three. And then from those, you can generate abundances. Um, and from those abundances, uh, you can essentially uh, build a table that can then uh, be uh, clustered. Um, and I think this will be touched on in the ecological statistics much more, um, but uh, you can cluster uh, samples or contigs that have similar um, abundance patterns. So the assumption is that, uh, that contigs um, that belong to the same genome will uh, change in abundance uh, similarly um, over several samples. And then in addition to that, um, you can also use Kamer composition um, to uh, determine genome bins. And so what we have here is just um, an example contig. Um, and then we are building a Kamer table uh, based on this contig. So 
Okay, can you, okay, you should be able to hear me now. All right. Yes, we are good. Sorry about that. Okay. If I click this button, it's going to go to the beginning, isn't it? Yep. Okay, um, so uh, we can go along this contig um, if the k-mer is uh, considered to be two, um, and then we can determine the frequency of that k-mer um, in our sequence. Um, so we go along the contig, um, the uh, k-mer is now tt, so we um, append um, the tt's counts, um, and we do this along the length of the contig um, until we've covered the whole contig and determined the camera sets. And so from uh, many contigs, um, we can determine the camera sets. Uh, so that's what's happening here. So for different contigs, uh, we're determining the frequencies of various cameras. And so based on this table, again, um, we can group contigs together um, that have similar KMER profiles. Um, and typically what's used uh, in, in, in this case are uh, tetranucleotide frequencies. So it would be uh, a KMER of four. And so um, again, uh, we use sequence composition and differential coverage um, to ultimately cluster our contigs together to form mags. And so just to make the differential coverage uh, piece um, a little more uh, transparent, if it wasn't already, um, if we have five samples, um, we want to map um, all of those reads um, against each sample. Um, so in this case, we'll have uh, five samples. So we'll have five sets of contigs and five sets of reads. So ultimately, we're going to create 25 BAM files. Um, and that's because uh, you want the differential component of, um, of the coverage. So you want abundance across multiple samples um, to better cluster your contigs together. Um, and then again, uh, installation uh, is uh, fairly straightforward. Um, and then using CoverM, uh, we can generate BAM files. Um, and it's, it's fairly straightforward to do. Um, so you have CoverM contig. So contig is an option within CoverM. Um, dash R is the reference. So I am uh, using the assembly um, as the reference and uh, uh, tw using 20 threads. Um, we are saving the BAM file um, into a, a BAM files directory. Um, and then what's at the end here are the paired reads. Um, so dash C stands for coupled. Um, so uh, each sample is coupled um, with a space. So this is the forward of the first sample, the reverse of the first sample. And then the next line is the forward of the second sample, the reverse of the second sample, and so on. 
And so what you'll get out of this command um, are five BAM files. And from those BAM files, you can determine coverages. Um, and so from those coverages, um, you can generate bins. Um, so we can use, we can just leverage um, the context that we have um, and then uh, input that into uh, uh, any assembler. So in this case, uh, I used Metabat2, Maxbin, and Concoct. Um, and then the, the binning algorithm will determine uh, sort of the Kamer frequencies. Um, and then you're also feeding it some sort of uh, coverage. Um, it may calculate it on its own, or you may provide it up front. Um, and again, uh, it'll be more explicit in the GitHub page that I'll be providing shortly after. And so um, there are uh, standalone binners, um, which are using that Kamer frequency and differential coverage. Um, and then there are ensemble binners. Um, and so what ensemble binners do, um, they combine the results of multiple tools into one aggregated um, set um, that is meant to be optimal. Um, so in this case, uh, there are really three uh, major options for that, um, which are DAS tool, uh, MetaRap bin refinement, and uh, Unite M. Um, and this figure in particular is showing DAS tool. Um, so what it's doing is uh, looking at the various bin sets that it has, um, predicting single copy genes um, in all of those bin sets, uh, aggregating um, some of those bins, um, and uh, choosing whichever uh, has the highest quality score, and then uh, basically removing anything else uh, that uh, it didn't match well. Um, so it's trying to build a, an end uh, set of bins uh, that are high quality, um, that reduce contamination as much as possible. Um, but generally, these sort of procedures can increase contamination um, just because you're moving contigs around, um, uh, around bins um, that maybe shouldn't have belonged together. And um, another example, like I mentioned, um, is MetaRap bin refinement. Um, so what, what the MetaRap bin refinement module does is um, it takes your assembly um, and binning with any three binning approaches. Um, so this is an important distinction between uh, DAS tool and MetaRap is that um, DAS tool can take any number of inputs um, MetaRap is still limited to only three, um, but generally it actually produces uh, fairly uh, good results. Um, so it can take uh, bins from three different programs uh, and basically uh, generate hybrid bin sets. Um, so it looks at uh, shared contigs between bins um, and it does this for every sort of iteration. Um, so it compares A and B together, A and C, B and C, um, and then A, B and C all together at once. Um, it predicts uh, the completeness of that bin and contamination. So what the quality of that bin is, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and then it leverages um, all the bin sets. So the originals, and the hybrid bin sets, and it selects uh, basically the best quality of, of those. Um, and it removes any contigs uh, from the less complete bins that, uh, that are in a more complete bin. And so this is an example of, of a basic command for it. Um, this is MetaRap bin refinement um, dash A, um, sort of represented in this figure here, but um, it's the output of one of your initial binners, um, dash B again, and dash C. Those are three different uh, initial binning tools. 
and then ultimately you output to some file. And so this is uh, what I was describing. Um, we have initial binning tools um, that leverage the uh, contig information. Um, and then we have ensemble binning tools that leverages uh, the output of those initial binning tools. And uh, once you generate a set of genomes, um, typically uh, you cluster genomes into what are considered species um, or populations. Uh, so what is represented here are um, two different strains. Um, and it's showing uh, potential bins uh, for these strains that were generated from different samples. So each of these is a bin uh, generated separately. And then uh, essentially what you're doing is comparing them to one another. Um, and then you select the one with the highest quality. Um, so you can see this one in the center um, has quite a bit of uh, uh, contamination um, from uh, both strains. Uh, so that one is not chosen as a representative here. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, you could also do a co-assembly. So what a co-assembly is, um, is uh, exactly what it sounds like. Um, you're assembling multiple samples together at once. Um, so you're just combining the read sets from many samples um, to create one assembly. Um, and uh, you can generate mags in the same way. Um, so mapping your reads to that co-assembly, but uh, ultimately um, you are combining uh, sequences from multiple samples that may have not actually been in those samples. Um, so it is possible that you have higher contamination, um, but you can also get more complete bins as well. So co-assembly is also a good strategy um, for pulling out bins from a sample. Um, and uh, for clustering uh, microbial genomes, um, DREP is one of the more popular. Um, and then GALA is another option that is uh, much quicker than DREP. Um, so just some general tips uh, for maximizing mag recovery. Um, and this is assuming that you're not limited um, by compute uh, resources. Um, so the first is just to use more than one assembly tool. Um, so even the minor differences uh, that a lot of the assembly tools have uh, can ultimately result um, in, in different contexts. Um, and so you will have a lot of redundancy, but you can also generate um, quite uh, distinct results as well. Um, so if you really want to maximize um, the number of bins you're getting out. Um, you could try more than one assembly tool. Um, you can subsample your original read sets uh, and then assemble them. Um, and again, that's more of an assembly optimization uh, technique. But um, again, you're you're sort of reducing the complexity there um, when you're subsampling down, so that potentially um, a contig could uh, be much longer. And then uh, third, uh, you read map against your recovered mags and reassemble uh, the remaining reads that do not map to the genomes. Um, so in that way, you're trying to uh, maximize all of the um, sequences that you have um, and you're getting rid of those uh, abundant lineages that could um, potentially uh, reduce the quality of your assembly uh, for the lower abundance organisms. And then four is to uh, leverage just as many um, standalone or initial binning tools as possible, um, and then feed them into those ensemble tools. And uh, so I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, quality control um, of genome bins. Um, so most of this is uh, is uh, coming from um, a, a paper that came out in 2020, I think. Um, uh, 
and it's uh, accurate and complete genomes from metagenomes. So um, sort of what this paper is trying to get at is to build a complete genome um, rather than just a mag. So a mag is not necessarily 100% complete, um, but uh, you'll, you'll see in a minute. Um, so uh, one important aspect of um, binning and mags is how do we determine the quality of those mags? Um, and ultimately you do that through single copy genes. Um, so completeness, uh, roughly is the number of unique single copy genes present with it have been um, divided by the number of unique single copy genes that should be present in the genome uh, for that lineage. Um, and then contamination, on the other hand, is am I seeing a single copy gene more than once? Um, and if so, that shouldn't be the case. Um, so uh, that means my bin is contaminated in some way. Um, and so there is generally uh, an accepted level of contamination. Um, so for the most part, uh, there is a standardized sort of um, mag quality um, that uh, came from JGI. Um, but uh, generally, if you have less than 10% contamination and greater than 70% completion, um, those bins are fairly safe to use typically. And the way that you can uh, generate um, quality estimates from your bins is through CheckM. Um, and so what CheckM does is it looks for those single copy genes um, in all of your bins uh, and calculates these statistics for you. Um, so an important thing to note about single copy genes is that they don't always um, account for all of the potential contamination. Um, so what you're seeing here on the right um, is an example of a, a bin that was generated. Um, and then uh, in this orange color um, is a different lineage um, taxonomically than what was in this green color. Um, and the only way they found that out was by doing um, some more manual refinement of their bin. Um, and so ultimately the contamination was slightly higher um, than what was reported by the single copy marker genes. Um, so the single copy gene um, as a report for, complete, uh, for completeness and contamination isn't always perfect, um, especially for uh, those lineages that it doesn't have uh, good references for. Um, but generally, it is pretty um, a, a good estimate uh, for your genome quality. Um, CheckM in particular, though, um, also something to note um, is that it cannot identify contamination well in incomplete genomes. Um, so so if you have a genome that is not very complete um, and you're trying to um, determine what the contamination is uh, based on the single copy genes, um, it, it doesn't do a very good job of estimating that accurately. Um, so uh, what you see here is uh, from a, a paper in 2017 um, where essentially they were combining um, random uh, contigs from uh, single cell um, amplified genomes. Um, and those genomes typically, at least in, in their case, were very low um, completion, but they were showing what the actual contamination was uh, because they knew which contigs were contaminating. Um, and so it shows it being much higher um, uh, than, than what CheckM was reporting. Uh, but um, ultimately, if you're using bins that have high enough completion, um, this really shouldn't be an issue. So again, that 70% that completion and 10% uh, contamination sort of threshold is, is a decent one um, for choosing uh, bins in your samples. And uh, one way 
to quality control your bins um, is through a tool called RefineM. Um, so what RefineM does is it can identify um, any potential outliers in your bins. And it can do that because uh, it basically generated statistics based on uh, reference genomes that it had access to at the time. Um, so so uh, what I'm doing here is uh, generating um, scaffold statistics um, for uh, my, my set of contigs here. Um, and then using the MetaRap generated bins uh, along with the BAM files to estimate coverages. Um, and then what that will generate is uh, uh, tetranucleotide frequencies. Um, it will generate coverages um, and, and some other associated stats to uh, determine what potential outliers are in your bin. Um, and so uh, the second command um, is determining the outliers. And then the third command is ultimately removing the outliers uh, from your bin set. And so this is um, one of the more automated ways um, to quality control a bin. Um, and there actually aren't very many of these. Um, so something else that you could potentially do with this too is taxonomic uh, uh, quality control as well. So if you have contigs that are clearly from another phylum, for example, uh, then you probably want to remove those. However, um, taxonomic quality control of bins could also be problematic. Um, so you have to be really careful with it because uh, just because a contig identifies as a certain lineage, um, that doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't actually belong with that lineage. Um, it may just be that we don't have a good enough reference in our reference database. Um, so, so use sort of the taxonomic quality control with, with caution, but it can be a good way to identify um, obvious um, uh, issues as well. Um, and so from this paper, uh, so what I, what I just outlined is a automated quality control technique. Um, and then this paper in particular uh, identified some very uh, more, much more manual techniques um, to quality control your bins. And so um, this really isn't feasible for many samples. Uh, and uh, if, if you have a very large data set with a lot of mags, um, this probably isn't possible. Uh, but uh, if you have interest in a specific lineage, then you can follow this sort of protocol um, to try to assemble uh, the best bin that you can. Um, and that's sort of why I was including it here. Um, so. Uh, you start uh, by reconstructing genome bins. Um, so again, this is using both those initial binning tools. Um, so MaxBin and Meta, uh, Metabat, and then also the, uh, the, the ensemble binning tools. So DAS tool, for example. And then up here, I've listed several others that they didn't mention um, down here. Um, and then you can compute estimates of genome completeness, um, like I said. Um, so there are different ways to do that. Um, Anbio is an option. Um, it has several references um, for single copy genes to determine genome completeness. Um, and then CheckM is uh, largely the standard uh, for doing this. Um, and then GGKBase also offers um, uh, a, a way to estimate genome completeness. And then if, if your genome is um, fairly complete and not very contaminated, um, something that they didn't list here, but is also uh, a good strategy is to map all of your reads um, that belong to that bin um, and then reassemble them. Um, so MetaRap actually offers a, a quick way to do this, um, but you can 
improve your, um, your completion, reduce contamination a bit, um, and it also increases the length of a lot of your contigs as well. Um, so it's a decent way to uh, try to in, uh, increase the quality of your bin. Um, and then uh, the third step that they listed is to check and remove um, contamination in the genome bin. And so I, I mentioned that a little bit. So Refinem is a more automated way to do that. Um, Anvio is a great option uh, to do it manually. Um, so it'll give you uh, sort of a um, distribution of coverages and GC content um, across your contigs and cluster them. Um, so you can do that manually. Um, and then there are also several other options. Um, and I mentioned um, taxonomy sort of uh, contamination removal. Um, so just, yeah, be, be cautious with, with really any of the contamination removal, but um, taxonomy is something you need to be wary of. Um, and then uh, the uh, fourth step that they have here is to check the number of scaffolds in a genome bin. And it says ideally the number is less than four. Uh, that is not very common um, that you're gonna have that few number of contigs in a genome bin um, that's also highly complete, uh, which you know is also why we don't have very many um, complete genomes. Um, but uh, even in their paper, I think they had something along the lines of um, 20 contigs within a genome bin. And they also went through this procedure and they were able to actually complete the genome and circularize it. Uh, so I think some of these are just suggestions um, for potential cutoffs for which bins you choose. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the I showed this earlier, but this is also uh, Anvio output. Um, so essentially what is being shown here um, is the GC content of a particular genome, um, every contig within that genome bin, um, and then abundances across multiple samples. So you can see that uh, right here, uh, along this breakpoint that they, that they have identified, um, the sort of, uh, uh, co-occurrence uh, relationship that existed in this green side um, no longer um, exists on the orange side. Um, so this is sort of an obvious marker uh, that it, is, it shouldn't belong to the bin that uh, this, uh, this right side belongs to. Um, and that is also represented in this hierarchical tree. Um, so it is using um, some of the statistics from the abundances and the sequence composition, again, um, to uh, cluster them together um, to build this sort of visualization for you. Um, and uh, so a couple other steps uh, are scaffold extension and overlap-based assembly. So again, going back to um, that overlap-based assembly that I was talking about earlier um, and that uh, you typically use for long reads, um, it could also be a method to uh, try to connect contigs uh, within your genome bins. And then uh, scaffold extension is also another option. Um, so uh, GGKBase has provided um, some uh, tutorial uh, of how to do this. Um, it is, uh, somewhat manual and requires uh, certain software. Uh, so it may or may not be feasible for your purposes. Um, but ultimately, uh, what you're doing is looking at the contigs in your, in your genome bin, um, looking at the reads that are hanging off the edges um, of, of a particular contig, um, aligning them, and then trying to take the consensus of those reads to extend out your contig even further uh, than what it is. Um, so in that way, you're building uh, longer contigs in your genome. Um, so hopefully you have a, uh, you can actually complete your genome and potentially circularize it. Um, and then uh, sort of uh, last check um, as well, um, 
is GC skew. So uh, GC skew uh, can give you some idea of uh, genome quality. Um, so typically within the genome, um, there is a very defined uh, GC skew uh, that happens at the origin, um, and it's sort of represented in the termination site here. But um, in, in, in either case, uh, uh, it is a way to check the orientation um, of your contigs. Um, so if the GC skew is not what you'd expect, um, then you can reorient um, your genome um, to fit the pattern better. Um, and it could also indicate contamination. So uh, if there are um, contigs that probably don't belong there, um, then you can remove them. Um, and so uh, that's mostly all that I had for today. Um, I will, again, also be providing uh, the tutorial um, via a uh, GitHub link. Um, so you should be able to install all the software, um, download the data, um, and run it through uh, some of these uh, tools. Um, I only go down to really the automated bin quality control um, because the, the manual is, is uh, a much more intensive process, um, but it could be potentially rewarding uh, if uh, your applications suit it. Um, so uh, who's going to be talking next time? Um, it's uh, Michaela Borton and uh, Mike Schaefer. Um, and they're going to be talking about DRAM, um, which is a genome annotation tool. So uh, it basically is uh, annotating the various metabolisms that uh, your genome contains. Um, and then also some genome resolved inference uh, that you can gain um, out of annotating your, your mags. Um, so uh, that's all I had. Um, uh, thank you for listening. Um, and if you ever have any questions, um, even on uh, any subsequent material that we're sending out, uh, please feel free to let me know now. Um, my email is also at the beginning um, of, this, of this talk as well. All right. It looks like we've got a question in the Q and A, um, and we should also give it a couple of minutes for people to ask more questions if they have them. Um, but the one we have now is, what's the difference between the depth file to produce anything? And Medibat two. People are saying anything. <laughs> uh. Can you hear me?
Um, so uh, it looks like there were a couple of questions um, that are still open. Um, uh, so uh, the first question here, uh, I, I hopefully you're still here. Um, it's uh, what's the difference between the depth files produced by Metabat2 and the coverage tables produced by Kinkot? Um, so uh, it'll be a little more transparent in, in the uh, GitHub um, tutorial that I send you. Um, but essentially, uh, they just take different inputs. Um, so you are calculating coverages and abundances uh, uh, from the BAM files. And then you are feeding them into uh, the binning tools. Um, so they just have um, some different mechanisms to actually calculate the coverage, um, but ultimately um, they should be fairly similar. Uh, and then uh, there was another question um, that is uh, for a whole genome assembly of a single bacterial genome which assembler would you suggest um, keeping the bacterial genome uh, size is just about two to four megabases. Um, so if, if you're doing uh, individual genome assembly um, and you are not doing, um, so, so if it's like an isolate, for example, um, then you can just use spades. Um, so not, the meta version, so not meta spades, but spades. Um, and it was actually built originally um, for doing single cell genome assembly. Um, so that should be a fairly good option for you. Yeah, I'm sorry if I can't hear anything as well. All right, I think that's all the questions. Thanks so much, everyone, for uh, joining us today. And never mind, there is a question. Um, so, yes. Um, so really, you could do it manually. Um, so you could uh, take all of, uh, so the question is, is there any other way um, than Anvio to perform manual binning? Um, so really what you could do is, uh, is calculate the tetranucleotide frequencies and the abundances across um, the samples and the contigs. Um, and then uh, actually input that into R and do some clustering as well. Um, so there is a manual option there. Um, there are several other tools uh, that also provide um, a manual curation step. Um, personally, I've found Anvio to be fairly uh, straightforward and there are lots of tutorials and things um, to use it. Um, but Yes, there, sh there should be other options. Um, I can't personally suggest um, very many others just because I haven't used very many others, um, but really you could uh, do it yourself as well. And, and to add on to that, um, so, many of the tools also provide a way to visualize um, the contact clustering as well. Um, so like MetaRap, um, off the top of my head, I know um, also provides an option to do that. Um, I think CheckM actually has some plots that you can generate um, for genomes. Um, so there are a lot of sort of visualization methods. Um, Anvio just provides a good framework to actually kick out any contaminating context that you have. 
All right, well, thank you so much, Dylan, and thank you to everyone who attended. Um,